I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, Paul says the gospel, or this message of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation. Now many times people talk about the power of God and what you have to do to get the power of God. And uh, I've been in Christian circles many years and I've been around people who say, well, we've got to fast and pray and we've got to do all these things so we can get the power of God. You see, Paul here doesn't say the power of God has anything to do with fasting or even praying, which, by the way, I'm not against prayer and I'm not necessarily against fasting if that's what you choose to do, but it doesn't get the power of God for you. The only thing the power of God is associated with is one thing, the gospel of Christ. The message of the gospel, Paul says, listen to this wording again, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it, that is the gospel, it is the power, it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, meaning resulting in salvation. Now I've had people get disturbed and upset about using this word salvation. In fact, right here in this very room, right in this building, right in this church, after the Sunday morning message, a woman approached me and was angry and was upset because I had in the message used the word salvation or the word saved, and she didn't like that. In my defense, I'll just say, it wasn't my fault. Uh, I wasn't choosing that vocabulary to be offensive. It's in the Bible. I don't have any choice. It's in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, saved and salvation, I don't have any choice but to use those words. But she didn't like those words because she said, what do I have to be saved from? Why do I need to be saved? What's all this talk about salvation? She said, isn't God love? And uh, I said, yes, he is. And the truth of the matter is, what, that's a good question. It's a good point. What is it that we need salvation? Why do we need salvation? Why is the gospel the power of God unto salvation? What's so important about that? Well, uh, let me put it this way. God is a God of love, but he's also righteous, and he's also a judge, a righteous judge. And by the way, I think everybody knows that. God is righteous, and he's a righteous judge. And if he were to judge your life strictly, and if he were to judge your life righteously, which he is obliged to do because he is strict and a righteous judge, uh, how would you fare if God were to assess your life righteously? In other words, this is the way most people think of it, by the way. If God had a big scale and he put your good deeds on one side and your bad deeds on the other side, um, how would you fare in that uh, weighing of your life? Well, most people uh, don't really feel that secure about it. In fact, the truth of the matter is we're told right here in this book of Romans, a little later in chapter 3, Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I don't care who you are, uh, that includes you. When Paul says all have sinned, that includes you and me and everyone else. All means everybody. A little later, if we get to chapter 6, the very last verse of chapter 6, Romans 6.23, Paul says, the wages of sin is death. So if God judges you strictly, it doesn't matter how many good works you've done. If you've sinned even once, if you've got even one sin, if you've fallen short of the glory of God, the wage that you've earned, if you get what you deserve from God, is death. You don't deserve anything from God other than death. But the gospel is the good news uh, unto salvation, resulting, the gospel of Christ is the uh, good news of Christ, for it is the power of God resulting in salvation. Salvation from what? Salvation from getting what you deserve, or being saved from uh, God's justice, or getting what you deserve from God. You know, by the way, uh, let me just say in passing that <clears throat> everyone knows this. This is instinctive knowledge that everyone has that they deserve death from God. I believe that everyone knows there's a God. I don't think there are any atheists. If you tell me that you're an atheist, my response is you're a liar. There aren't any atheists. There are only people with a lot of uh, big talk. Uh, atheists do not exist. Everyone knows instinctively there's a God, though some people try to suppress that knowledge some people try to ignore that knowledge. Everyone in their heart of hearts knows there's a God. It's instinctive. It's inside of each one of us. Everybody knows there's a God. And secondly, everybody knows, just like we know there's a God, everyone knows that God is righteous, just, and holy. Everyone has that instinctive knowledge. And third, just like we know there's a God in heaven who's righteous, just, and holy, we also know there's me on earth who's not. We know there's a God. We know He's just and righteous and holy. But we also have instinctive knowledge that I fall short of God's glory. Everyone knows that instinctively. That's knowledge that everyone has. And by the way, that doesn't necessarily be, uh, need to be preached. It doesn't help any to preach uh, how bad everybody is and to talk about sin 
and to uh, name all the different sins and, and to mention all the different bad behaviors. To preach about that has no effect at all. In fact, it's, it makes things worse. It would be like if you were sick and suffering and in pain and you went to the doctor and all he did was say, you know what, you're sick and in suffering and in pain. Let me describe your symptoms to you. Yes, that's right. You're sick, suffering and in pain. See you next week. Uh, give me $20 and come back next week. Uh, that wouldn't make you better, would it? Just to reinforce the symptoms. What you go to the doctor for is the remedy. And what we need to uh, receive from God is not a, uh, and from the church, what we need to receive uh, from God's representatives on earth, that is the church, that is us, what people need to receive, what you need to receive, is the remedy. Not to reinforce the problem, but the remedy. And here Paul tells us what the remedy is. The gospel of Christ is the power of God resulting in salvation. This word salvation, actually, if you look it up in a Greek dictionary, it's a very broad word. It doesn't just mean conversion and becoming a Christian. It means everything concerning deliverance from evil, deliverance from the power of evil. Everything concerned with uh, healing is included in this. Everything concerned with deliverance from, from anything that's wrong and anything that's bad. In fact, I can say it this way, anything that's wrong in your life, the, result, the, the, the remedy for it is found in the message of Christ. In the, in the power, it is the power of God resulting in salvation or deliverance or being made whole. It's the power that produces that. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. Listen to this. To everyone that does one thing. To everyone that believeth. Paul said the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth. Now here Paul makes a distinction. Not everyone believes the gospel. The gospel is a message of good news. It's about what Jesus did for us at the cross. And by the way, what did Jesus do? Let me just say it this way, in case you just think I'm, uh, I'm uh, you know, using my own words. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul plainly tells us what the gospel is. And uh, he defines it for us. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I want to remind you of the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you've received, wherein you stand, by which you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, comma, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So Paul says, I want to remind you, Corinthians, of the Gospel, I preached it to you, you believed it, and by that you're saved. I want to remind you of it. He's closing now, so in closing I want to remind you of the gospel, and here it is. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. So the message of the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins and that he was raised again from the dead, Paul says, according to the scriptures. Well, how is that a message of good news, and how is that the power of God resulting in salvation? And in fact, a person could say, well, how, what does that even have to do with me? The fact that one man died 2,000 years ago, for instance, as I read a theologian said that. Um, well, it's, it's because of these little words, for our sins. It just doesn't say, Paul doesn't say the gospel is that Jesus died, but that Jesus died, listen, for our sins. Or let's be personal, for your sins. Now, Paul tells us in the book of Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I've told you that you instinctively know that. I instinctively know that. Everybody instinctively knows that. But what's the remedy? Well, God's remedy is not to punish you for your sins. And let me add in passing, God's plan was never to punish you for your sins. It was never on His mind to punish you for your sins. But it was always in His mind to punish Jesus for your sins. 